So I'm going to talk about uh, my career um, as a software developer um, for about 10 years or so. My name is Luigi. Um, when I was starting this talk, I remembered that the first ever tweet I did way back when, when Twitter was just starting, was where I was announcing that I'm finally writing Ruby on Rails. Um, so this was my first ever tweet. And then looking at it, I realized that it was actually made in 2007. And then I did the arithmetic, and I was like, oh, it's not actually been a decade. So another, uh, another title for this could be crafting a career in software development. So crafting being the operative wor wor uh, word there, the idea of kind of intentionally going about making a career as a software developer. And the genesis for this talk has been um, me Coming to these events in recent years, um, I, um, like Al, had been coming here a while. I think 2007 or so is when I started. Um, and I've seen that there are a bunch of new folks coming into the industry through code schools, um, through the fact that the industry is making inroads and in increasing diversity. Um, so I wanted to make uh, kind of a talk about how I built up my career, and hopefully that can, can help some of y'all who are looking to break in. Um, before I do that, I just want to stop and do a kind of a privilege check. So there's a lot of talk in the industry about diversity and bringing, being more inclusive and bringing new people in. And I am fully aware that I look like a software developer, and that's a certain advantage. Um, and uh, I, uh, economically went to a good college, I did not graduate with student loan debt. All these things matter when you're kind of building your career and uh, jumping from place to place or, or doing whatever you, you, you need to do to, to be successful. So while everything I'm going to say maybe is not going to be applicable to everybody, hopefully some of this stuff does, does apply to you. Uh, so way back when, in 2005, um, I went to a four-year code school. They were all four years back then. Um, and uh, it was called Georgia Tech. Um, and I was about to graduate. Um, at my time at Georgia Tech, I really kind of had a, a pretty huge man crush on this guy here who's screaming. Um, who, who's this guy? Who's this screaming guy right here? Howard Dean. Right. So uh, Howard Dean ran for president uh, in 2003, 2004. Um, and he was kind of a very innovative candidate. He was uh, one of the first, or the first candidate to really use the power of the internet to organize. Um, and I just really got into his campaign. I wasn't at all political before. I, I saw him on TV, read about him. Uh, but I did a like, students for Howard Dean chapter on campus um, and did kind of, kind of was just really into that campaign, of course. He, his campaign just completely uh, failed uh, during the primaries. Um, and I had a sad, but um, I kind of actually used my involvement in the Students for Dean uh, group uh, to kind of parlay that into uh, my, my future career. So I graduated 2005 um, from tech. I uh, didn't really have too many job opportunities. I think people think if you go to a four-year school like tech and you actually graduate in four years and you have somewhat good grades, like it's, you know, the jobs are just going to come for you. That's actually not true. Um, I had one like, kind of big interview with Microsoft where they actually flew me from here to Redmond. Um, and then uh, I had this like crazy day-long series of, of interviews and I did terribly in, in them and did not get that job. I was also offered an internship by Howard Dean's uh, PAC, his political action committee, which was uh, his organization after the presidential campaign ended so that he could still do like activism stuff and the people who had been Howard Dean supporters around the country could still continue to their activism. So that's called Democracy for America. It still exists. And um, I was offered an internship there as a programmer. So that's what I did. I, I moved up. So this is in Vermont. Howard Dean's from Vermont. So I packed my, my car, my little car here in Atlanta, and then drove up to Vermont. Um, so at this time, the language I knew best uh, was PHP. Um, I worked on, at the Georgia Tech uh, Office of IT, OIT, and I did some PHP projects there. 
This is the first thing I ever built as a professional. Uh, this is in 2005. Check out the amazing tabs. Um, this, uh, this was built on uh, essentially spaghetti code PHP. So back then, uh, PHP was actually a pretty good thing for making websites, and still is, I shouldn't disparage it. Um, and, but back then, when you made a PHP app, it was literally like, imagine if, you, if you're familiar with uh, ERB, right? You, make, you have an ERB template. Imagine your whole program going into that one ERB template. That's what PHP was like. So essentially, you had, you had some require, like you could include like a header and a footer, and like you had at least that. But then you, you literally made the, the database call. You wrote SQL, a, a string of SQL. Uh, you got the data back, and then as an array of arrays, and then that's what you used um, to make your page. So just imagine like your entire, all, all your stuff being in. So it was, it was, it was not at all structured. It was, it was a pain, it was error prone. Um, but it, you know, it works like the, that's what people did back then. Um, around this time, this was 2005, um, there was this video going viral. And thinking back on it, like I had no idea how this actually went viral because in 2005, there was no Reddit, there was no Hacker News. Uh, I, YouTube might have been that popular then. Yeah, so Slashdot was probably the main avenue. Um, and it was a video of uh, this Danish guy uh, building a blog using this th new thing called Rails. Um, so if you have some time, just look on Google, like Rails demo. I'm sorry, look on YouTube for Rails demo. It's a pretty incredible uh, piece of computer science history, really. So that was going on. Rails was getting some traction. I was reading about it um, because I was a, a web developer, so I was trying to keep up. Um, and after about a year or a year and a half of popularity, uh, Rails 1.0 came out. And what was real, what, so what was amazing about Rails at this time? The first, I think, was that there was this thing called Active Record that abstracted away the database. Um, that pattern had been around for a few years, but to see it done in Ruby was actually kind of a really nice thing. Um, the another part are, were generators and scaffolding to get started really quickly. I think we still all use generators these days in Rails. Um, is scaffolding still in Rails? I'm not entirely sure. Um, but obviously you're not, you shouldn't use it too much. Um, but that was still an impressive thing. And then um, another thing was that this was the cusp of what was called the Web 2.0 era. And um, that meant like using JavaScript for very um, s somewhat silly things. Um, and the two libraries that Rails shipped with, the JavaScript libraries Rails Rail shipped with, at the beginning they were called Prototype and Scriptaculous. Uh, Prototype is probably the worst name ever to give <laughs> a, a JavaScript library because obviously we had prototypes in JavaScript. So when you would say the word prototype, or even type the word prototype on the internet, it wasn't clear what you were talking about. This was also, to be, to be fair, I guess to people back then, no one wrote very good JavaScript. Maybe no one really understood what uh, prototype, uh, prototypical language was, so they got away with it. Um, but Scriptaculous was, was quite something. Um, you could see how Web 2.0 it was. You can see the gradient effects on the <laughs> background. You can see the drop shadows of the logo. Very Web 2.0. And I got such a kick out of researching this when um, we were, uh, when I was making this presentation, that I decided to actually show you some of these amazing effects of Scriptaculous. And amazingly, this is uh, the, the, the guy, Thomas Fuchs, still has the documentation um, up and running. So uh, the, the idea of Scriptaculous was there was, we, we could do some Ajax things back then, just a very few. Um, and so we needed to like tell the user that things were happening. So the main way to do this uh, was through highlighting things. So um, this was amazing back here. So you could do something and then trigger a highlight and then it would fade, right? So that was really impressive. Um, then, we, well, we have to use this kind of cool animation some, somewhere else. So another one was appear. Um, so we needed to make squares just appear on the page. And that, that was great. Um, of course, we had them appear. So now they had to fade out. So we got the fade out effect. And then 
Um, of course, the best ones were uh, Pulsate, which was, you know, <laughs> you need to, to do that. Or then, of course, uh, Shake, and just, that was great. So amazing effects back then, the state of the art. Um, that's, what, that's what Java, that's, that was literally the, the definition of what JavaScript brought to the table. That was it, that was effects like that. A little bit of Ajax. Um, Rails has had a strange, awkward relationship with JavaScript its entire life. It's almost like this weird teenage romance where um, it doesn't know what quite to do. It's a bit awkward. So RJS uh, was another technology. No one uses it anymore, thank thankfully. Um, here's the, the, re the release of uh, RJS. This is DHH um, writing a blog post. Uh, JavaScript written in Ruby. It's the perfect antidote for your JavaScript blues. Sorry. Um, it's the brainchild of this guy, Sam Stevenson, who also did a prototype. So essentially the idea was, and you can even see the effects here, right? Because this is what people did. They, they made effects. Uh, you write some Ruby, and that's actually pretty legible, right? If the card size is one, uh, do the appear effect. If not, do the highlight effect. Um, this was, you know, this was hard to maintain. It eventually went away. Um, but it was an interesting kind of artifact of how Ruby and Rails felt about JavaScript in the beginning, which is it was so bad that you had to actually just write Ruby and you couldn't, you didn't even want to write JavaScript. So at this time, um, I was still a PHP developer. I was, I was reading about all this cool new Rails stuff. Um, and I didn't want to quite make the leap to Ruby yet because I've heard, I was reading all these scare stories about how hard it was to deploy Rails. Um, and, and in the age of like before Heroku, it actually was quite difficult. Um, I think sometimes that the early Rails community spent just as much effort on Rails as a framework as it did all the ways to deploy it, um, Capistrano, tools like that, as well as all the different servers, web servers that Rails was on. So I uh, started using Cake PHP, which was admittedly just a, a clone of Rails written in PHP. It brought structure, the structure you, you know from Rails, MVC, all that good stuff, generators. Um, so I was then starting to able to produce better stuff. And I then redid the website for Democracy for America. This, again, you can even see it even looks better, not just the framework underneath it was better. Uh, we got, again, more Web 2.0 stuff. If, if you can see it, it's, Got a sweet red gradient here. Uh, we got the, the nice, smooth, rounded corners on the tabs. We got the drop shadows, great stuff. Um, at this time, I, so I was learning more about building websites. I was only a year or two out of college at this point. Um, Democracy for America was using a contractor to do a lot of its technology before I came aboard. Uh, what happened was there was a Dean campaign. There were all these like tech, technologists working for the Dean campaign. Howard Dean uh, failed, he, he lost, and then all these technologists, uh, they all went almost directly from Vermont to Washington, D.C., and then became these technical consultants in D.C. One of these companies was doing the consulting for Democracy for America. Um, they were also very expensive, and uh, since I was on board, and they gave me the amazingly um, senior title of Deputy Technology Director at Democracy for America, Funny story, my, my, uh, my job titles have, have gotten like, less and less impressive as my, my career has gone on. Um, so they, uh, there was this tech company, this consultancy, uh, their CEO like, flew to um, Vermont to tell us, hey, we, we, we still provide you value, but they're like, no, we have Luigi, he'll do everything. Um, so I had this, this really kind of like contentious, not contentious, but odd, a meeting with, with the CEO, like, I was like, I don't want to be here with him because he thinks I'm costing him business, but whatever. That will, that will come into play later on. Um, so I, uh, I did some stuff for DFA, it was really fun. Um, it, was, it was in Vermont, Vermont was really cold, so before my second winter there, I got out, I was like, I'm not going to live here anymore, I was, started moving back down to Atlanta. Uh, before I did that, I went to this one conference. Um, this was an unconference. Uh, like a bar camp. It was called Roots Camp. This was a convening of uh, mostly left of center democratic politics. Uh, this was after the 2006 campaign, so that was a midterm um, where uh, Democrats won Congress back. 
And so there was this huge like convening of progressive folks in DC. Um, and it was an on conference just talking about you know, lessons learned. Um, I went, I presented on DFA link in my work at Democracy for America. And I eventually would actually meet uh, almost all my future managers at this conference. So that was a, kind of a big thing. Um, I went to Atlanta and then uh, just to kind of bring my stuff down. And there happened to be a Pragmatic studio uh, in Atlanta. So Pragmatic, so I think most folks are familiar with Pragmatic Publishing. They, they publish a lot of books. Um, before, uh, I think they, this might still exist, but they just do video courses now. Um, they would do kind of three-day courses of, to learn some new technology. Um, just for, it wasn't very expensive either. So I did the, the one here in Atlanta. Um, I was actually taught by Dave Thomas, was one of the instructors. Dave Thomas uh, is famous for writing the, the pickaxe, it's called the pickaxe book, um, which is a, the big Ruby book. Um, and I learned Rails. I, I, realized, I, thought, I said to myself, you know, there's just a lot of momentum behind Rails. I don't want to be stuck doing PHP for my, for my whole career. Um, so starting in 2007, uh, kind of my first Rails work. Um, before I could even find, uh, so early, early in 2007, uh, Rails 1.2 came out. This was the first time REST was introduced in the Rails world. It was a kind of a big deal. Um, and uh, it was, it was a, kind of the right call. It was, it was uh, kind of forward thinking and it gave uh, people's code bases a lot more structure and a lot, a lot, better, a, a lot better conventions. Later that year, there was more REST uh, in Rails 2.0. And uh, Active Resource was uh, released. Active Resource is an interesting library. Um, essentially, the idea there was if Rails is making these, you can make these RESTful APIs with Rails using you know, the, the Rails controllers. Active Resource said, we, we need something to consume these, these RESTful APIs, um, much like you can consume a database from Active Record. Uh, they provided something called Active Resource to do that. Uh, didn't really ever catch on. It was, it was a fine idea, but didn't really catch on. There, there eventually were better gems out there like HTT, HTT Party and Faraday and Typheus that, that also did that, and probably better than Active Resource. Um, so this was 2007. Um, I was back here in Atlanta. I started working remotely for this place called uh, the WebStrong Group. Uh, this was a consultancy. They're, they, they're not around anymore. They were always very small. Um, but they did consulting for congressional candidates and for uh, nonprofits in DC. Um, so I helped uh, work on the websites uh, for the elections of some senators. Uh, we got some, some white men in, in the Senate that year. That was, that was great. Um, we uh, finally. Um, we, we did a really cool, um, a cool uh, site for Hip Hop Caucus, um, which is a, a cool nonprofit based in DC. Um, all these sites, they're really just CMSs. Um, that's what a campaign needs mostly, um, especially back then. Now, now they're a bit more, there's a bit more stuff going on. But back then they were just CMSs, so I learned all about CMSs. I use an open source, or uh, we use an open source um, blogging, Rails blog framework called Mephisto um, as, our, as our thing, which was a, a, a way that I like, learned about reading on someone else's code base because it's an open source. Um, with SEIU, that's a labor union. I built uh, a social kind of a social network for the SEIU, which was a lot like the DFA link social network I, I built for DFA. So I uh, kind of built on top of that. Um, and around this time, I also uh, started I think this has been my most successful open source project, uh, which was a gem called uh, around the Sunlight, La uh, Sunlight Foundation API. So the Sunlight Foundation is a nonprofit that focuses on open government and government transparency and open data. Um, and when building uh, the social activism tools for the labor union, they wanted a uh, contact your, or know who your member of Congress is feature uh, based on your address. So the Sunlight Labs API did that, and then I wrote the Ruby wrapper around it. Um, and that will play, come into play very soon. Um, I, at this time, this was around 2007, 2008, um, I also started going to more conferences um, around uh, the region, around Ruby. 
So I went to, there's a, there's a conference called Acts as Conference in Orlando. There was a conference called uh, Ruby Hoedown in Huntsville. Um, and when I was driving down, driving back from Huntsville, from Hunts Vegas, as the locals call it, um, I was like, you know, we have a, we have a meetup in Atlanta. We should do a, we should do a Ruby conference in, in Atlanta. So um, I worked uh, with uh, Tim Kadem, who used to come. I haven't seen him at one of these meetings in a while, but he works with ThoughtWorks uh, now. And we put on a conference around, not around Rails, but around Merb. So Merb was an up and coming um, Ruby framework. It was kind of designed as sort of a, um, as an alternative to Rails, uh, whereas Rails was like this kind of very opinionated thing. Merb was more modular. You can kind of use the parts you want. You can substitute in different, uh, different ORMs as you, as you want to. Um, it just had a little bit different philosophy and it was gaining a lot of traction in, in kind of the world um, of Ruby web development. So we decided to make a conference, uh, a one day conference around Merb. Who here went to Merb Day? Did anyone? Awesome. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, we had Yehuda Katz come. Yehuda Katz was the lead developer of Merb. Um, he, he gave, a, I think his, his like final keynote was all about the future of Merb because it was, it was 1.0, it was going to become 2.0. Um, so this was uh, December 6, 2008. Uh, we, had, we had the, I, I assume, the first and only a Ruby conference here in Atlanta called Merb Day. Uh, on, and then December, so I'll, I'll say it again, this was December 6, 2008. Um, and then on December 23rd, 2008, uh, Yehuda, Yehuda wrote this blog post that said, Rails and Merb are merging. Um, and then essentially he's saying, um, the plan is to merge things that made Merb different. This will make it possible to use Rails 3 for the same sorts of use cases effectively. Merb 2 is Rails 3. This was huge. This was a very dramatic moment in the, in the Ruby world. I thought it was... I checked if it was April 1st when I saw the news. Um, and so eventually this would become, uh, it, Yehuda was essentially the, the kind of lead developer uh, on, on him and, and another guy, Carl, um, on Rails 3, and eventually they would, they would build it. Um, before that, though, a few months later was Rails 2.3. So this had no MERB at all because by this point, you know, this, this announcement was December, Rails 2.3 was probably in beta back th by then, so um, this came out. A lot of people think this is like the, great, the greatest version of Rails ever, ever listed. I think um, <laughs> there's, I think GitHub still runs on this. Um, it's kind of like the OG Rails, right? So it has uh, some good stuff, it has Rack, it has Metal, like so it was built on top of Rack, which was um, a huge, step forward um, to have that low level technology, low level um, layer um, that was then shared with Merv and shared with uh, Sinatra, um, had engines, it had this idea of templates, um, which because uh, Rails infuriatingly does not call view files templates, they call them views. Um, these templates were not about like HTML templates. These templates were about uh, kind of responding to the world of uh, consultancies making a lot of Rails apps and making a lot of new Rails apps for clients. They need to quickly start up their, their Rails apps, how they kind of liked it with their opinion. So these are templates for new apps. Um, so back to my, my career story. So 2009, um, I, was, I moved up to DC with um, my girlfriend and my wife. Um, and I started working at the Sunlight Foundation, which is where I had previously made that gem, um, that open source gem. So there's a pretty direct line between uh, me you know, doing something open source just because it was useful to me and then kind of making an open source library around it and then getting this job. Hilariously, the, the director of the Sunlight Labs, the development wing of Sunlight Foundation who hired me uh, was the same guy who several years earlier when I was working at Democracy for America, he came up as the consultant to try to save his business because from, um, he, was, he was the same guy. He just moved on to Sunlight Foundation. So apparently I did not piss him off too much for that. Um, and so at Sunlight Foundation, 
I worked on open data stuff. This was National Data Catalog, which is like an early data.gov. Um, this is Polygraphed, which uh, lets you put in the URL or do a bookmarklet um, of a news article, and then you get, so let's say this, this is pretty old, but this is about something, an article about John McCain. Uh, you can't really see it, but it would highlight John McCain's name, and then it would highlight any like companies. So this highlighted Lockheed Martin, the defense contractor, and then it would use open data to like figure out that Lockheed Martin had contributed so much mo such and such amount of money to John McCain's campaigns. Um, at this point, when this was, uh, yeah, so this was 2010, 2011, I was also starting to do a lot more speaking. Um, I was also doing some writing. This is on Google's um, HTML5rocks.com website. Um, I did a uh, launch app in the Chrome Web Store called Stream Congress, and it's about WebSockets and event source. Um, back then, WebSockets uh, were possible in Ruby, but not in Rails. I was also doing a lot of speaking. Here's a blog post I wrote. Um, this is in 2010, and at this point, this, there's kind of an amazing thing happening in the R Ruby community uh, worldwide where a lot of people were actually doing their own regional conferences. Um, there was one all the time. And a lot of this is thanks to uh, Ruby Central, the people who do RailsConf and RubyConf. Uh, they would actually seed, provide seed money to, to organizers to do uh, these conferences. So at one point in, 20, in 2010, um, I wrote how there were 13 events, Ruby events, and these were you know, big events, not just meetups, big events in the span of eight weeks. They were in Massachusetts, Brazil, Texas, Japan, Tennessee, Utah, Illinois, California, Virginia, Arizona, Vermont, Ohio, Colorado, they were everywhere. Um, so I was doing a lot of speaking on behalf of Sunlight. I was talking about civic hacking, I was talking about open data. Uh, here's a very small amount of the number of the badges I collected um, around this time. Um, so a few uh, months uh, into 2010, or actually halfway through 2010, this was the MERB merge, um, and uh, DHH was just obsessed with this slogan, have it your way, to describe it. Uh, have it your way comes from Burger King, because apparently you can like custom order your burgers. Um, <laughs> And he said, this is, this is now true of Rails, um, which I guess, yeah, it was technically true. Uh, this was also the first release with Bundler, the, the tool we all know and love. Um, a year later was Rails 3.1. Um, hilariously, and this, this again goes to this weird relationship with JavaScript, um, Rails was very slow to adopt jQuery as its, its default. Um, part of the have it your way thing was that by default, Rails was still uh, installing prototype uh, for, for DOM manipulation. jQuery, by 2010, definitely by 2011, had clearly won. Like this, everyone was using it. Um, but Rails, the core team, did not want to change. They finally changed in 2011. Uh, they, had, they launched also the asset pipeline. Um, they, again, included uh, more languages, SAS, which is uh, it was pretty good, and then somewhat controversially, CoffeeScript which is more goes to the, hey, we don't want to write JavaScript type mentality. Um, so that's 2011. Back to me, 2012, um, I joined um, a startup. So I was living in DC, working at the Sunlight Foundation, and then just from a kind of home life standpoint, my, my uh, then girlfriend, now wife, and I wanted to move back down here to Atlanta. I needed to look for another job because Sunlight is only based in DC. Um, I found uh, a job uh, with a media company that was just starting up called Upworthy. Um, Upworthy is kind of a viral media type company. Um, I was given a somewhat impressive job title of founding engineer, although I'm not a founder. I was just, uh, I think, the fifth employee. Um, and at Upworthy, um, uh, it was pretty cool this was a startup. It was a brand new thing. I was, I was kind of helping decide the technology. Um, I decided to go away from, from Rails uh, to build the first version of the app, which was essentially just a CMS. Um, I used Sinatra. Uh, and I used Sinatra because I, at that point, and maybe I was affected by groupthink here, is that Rails really, especially at 3.3.1, was getting very big. There's a lot of stuff going on in Rails. I just 
And I just found the kind of simplicity of Sinatra um, a lot more appealing. And I thought, hey, we can, we, can, we can build what we need to on Sinatra. We actually use Padrino, which is a Sinatra uh, framework built on top of Sinatra with, with a few more libraries. Um, I spoke at RailsConf in Chicago a couple of years ago, along with one of my colleagues, um, about our time building uh, uh, the, the app at Upworthy. Actually, I presented it here um, about a year and a half ago, too. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, the, the big thing about Upworthy um, and how it was interesting for my career was um, this was a startup. This was really one product uh, with, with focus on for the entirety of my time there. Um, this wasn't where I was building a bunch of apps for, for clients or building a bunch of apps for Sunlight Labs, which is kind of an experimental type organization. We, we build a lot of stuff. This was just one thing. This was one company. It's going to, you know, that's the code base. Um, and we, we were able to grow as a startup is supposed to do. Um, so we grew quite a bit in the first couple of years. Um, and then, um, oh, and at this time, uh, during this growth, we eventually moved, moved to Rails. Um, and we moved, moved to Rails because, uh, mostly because of, I would say, the communities relying on the strength of the community was actually a big part where, by that I mean, um, the, the libraries, uh, the, the, the open source gems out there that were a bit more specific to Rails rather than just Ruby or, or Sinatra in general, um, as well as a community of, of people. Of, of, so from a hiring standpoint, we're a startup that's hiring. Um, it's probably more appealing to, to folks to work on Rails apps than to be on this like Sinatra app, but it's actually this weird framework that no one's really heard of. So um, that. Uh, we, we moved to Rails. Uh, Rails 4 at this time came out, this was uh, almost three years ago. Um, this, this version of Rails, Rails 4, um, really was actually a very kind of interesting, um, it was almost like a reaction to, I would say, Angular and Ember and the world of single page apps um, back maybe by Node, where that was kind of where the direction of of web apps were going, much more dynamic, much more um, UI heavy on the front end. Um, and so as kind of a way to still like do Ruby, I think the Rails core team, DHH, did things like Russian doll caching, turbo links, e-tags, although e-tags, I think just for actions, e-tags in general are a good technology you should use, but um, this was kind of in, in service of making single page apps. Um, I personally don't really use any of these technologies. Uh, when, when making Rails apps, um, I think job, JavaScript frameworks are much better to, to accomplish what those do. Um, and then some bad news. Um, so Upworthy did some layoffs um, earlier this year, and uh, they, they, there was a kind of the public um, pronouncement was there was a, a pivot to video. Um, and because it was a pivot to video, they laid off most, uh, most of the people laid off were on the were pro product managers and engineers, um, the more expensive product managers and engineers, of which I was one. Um, so I was, I was out. Um, and that's a pretty kind of interesting takeaway, which is you can be called a founding engineer. You can be with a company since the beginning as an early employee, but you know, you're not really safe. Um, even Steve Jobs, you know, who founded Apple Computer, famously was more or less fired from Apple in the 80s. Um, it happens. So looking for a new gig in this, or early this year, um, what I kind of landed on was, was still a media company. Um, I think I felt that I, I was still interested in the media space. Um, and so I started working for Vox Media uh, about a month ago. Um, they do a bunch of brands like The Verge, uh, Vox.com, Polygon. Um, they just they have a lot of stuff. Um, they they are also a Rails um, Rails company. They probably run the, the most highly trafficked Rails app out there. It's it's you know all these sites are pretty popular. Um, there's there's a ton of traffic. I was hired to do a very work on a very specific part of their uh, CMS of their code base, um, and that is kind of understanding um, how people are consuming content these days, uh, online content. Um, it's moving away, obviously, from desktop more to mobile. Um, and because the mobile experience can be you know, rough, especially with a lot of media sites who just have so many JavaScripts 
and so many trackers on their sites, the, the, the user experience is pretty terrible. Um, both Google and Facebook have started pushing publishers to do these kind of mobile-centric technologies like instant articles, um, and Google's, it's called Accelerated Mobile Pages, or AMP. So the idea is you kind of do a Google search, and then there's like these cards that show up, um, and then when you click on one of those articles, it loads really quickly like a native experience. Um, so essentially what, what I was able to do is because I was also kind of thinking about these and working on these sorts of things at Upworthy, um, Box saw that and you know, upon in interviews started talking to me about it and they realized, hey, this is, you know, this is a person who can really help us in this, in this space. Um, and then, as Al was alluding to, um, looking towards the future, uh, Rails 5 is coming sometime, maybe hopefully this year. Um, and the big things are you know, action cable for WebSockets, WebSocket support, um, API mode as well. So if you're not, you know, if you just want a Rails app as an API, as a JSON API. Um, again, this is, this is a Rails almost kind of like understanding that the, the, the really good JavaScript frameworks out there um, don't need all the stuff that Rails provides. And if you want just, you know, it, as the data layer, as that server, um, Rails can be there. So some, some takeaways. So I think that moving forward, I think React plus Rails is a really good stack. If, you're, um, if you want to continue Rails, um, that's, you know, learning React if you haven't yet, understanding how that works, how that benefits you, and specifically how it handles um, and deals with complexity of, of very complex web, uh, web apps that have a lot of parts, a lot of components, um, and managing that well. React is really good for that. Um, other stacks that I've been playing with, Elm, uh, which is a front-end kind of JavaScript. Uh, it's a language based on JavaScript. It's not at all JavaScript, uh, but it's, a, it's definitely a front-end UI language. Uh, and the back-end Phoenix Elixir. Uh, Phoenix is um, a web framework, and Elixir is a, a language built on top of Erlang, um, Ohm and ClojureScript. Ohm and, Clo and Ohm is another kind of, uh, so ClojureScript, I should say, is uh, Clojure running on top of Java, and then Ohm is a React library on, uh, built in ClojureScript. Clojure is a, another backend library built on top of the JVM. Um, these kind of backend library, uh, backend frameworks or languages um, are built on kind of more robust runtimes than uh, Rails is, and they really do kind of respect or, or are, are geared towards a multi-core kind of multi-core kind of world. Um, there's a lot of functional programming going on here. I think the industry is headed that way. Um, so that's that's my little bit about uh, technology, I, and then I will close with a few reflections about my career. Um, the first thing I would say, if, especially this is morally more most geared to to folks who are new to the industry, is it's to really find your niche. So I found my niche in the world of kind of politics, advocacy, and then eventually I moved, moved uh, to media. Um, being able to like have that domain knowledge and not about a specific industry, a specific field beyond software development um, is a really kind of powerful thing and it's, it's a great selling point for you as, as a software developer. Uh, and just kind of showing here how um, my, you know, my future boss, uh, so I, uh, at this one conference in 2006, uh, my future bosses of all of these, my or managers, um, were all at the original Roots Camp, which was pretty cool. Um, another thing is uh, you may have to move. If you can, you may have to move. Um, I know there's a lot of cheerleading going on about Atlanta, um, and we do have some really great industries here. We have uh, in, there's like mar a marketing, uh, email marketing, um, and, and sales uh, kind of niche. Um, and th those, are, those are great, those are strong, those are money making, um, those are stable. There is a niche around security. So there's like pin drop security and um, Bastille um, and some other um, companies like that. So th there are some niches. Um, but you know, there's other cool technologies out there. Um, try to see if you can. Uh, you know, can you move? Can you move just for a little while? Um, it might make sense for you.
Another thing is that, um, and this is this is really uh, a thing about like working on uh, making doing your projects. Like side projects are great, um, but the reality is like for you to to be a a, a candidate that's desirable um, to other to, to to prospective employers, um, you really do need that experience of real world apps. Um, I think I've I've talk to some folks who just like go from a code school to like do their own startup and they think that's like a, a good path and honestly it's really not. Um, you really need to understand what it's like to work for a company or an organization where there's a lot of people using the software that you're, you're working on that, it, that, that there's real stress involved when that software doesn't work, when the software, when that Rails app goes down um, and what it means to support a Rails app you know, at some 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 level of scale, or or any app at any any level of scale, um, and uh, when your software actually affects your business or your organization and has a real effect, like that's just kind of the pressure uh, and and uh, a scenario that just can't be replicated by side projects or by classroom projects. Um, so really, do do you seek out to work on real real world apps? Another thing is to really embrace getting down into like the weeds. Um, I think even for me at the beginning, there's a lot, when I was, I, I remember uh, starting Rails, a lot of it seemed magical, um, but in, in the end, nothing is. Um, so get good at reading code. Um, just just you know, force yourself to, to read the Rails code base or the code base of gems you use. Um, understand how they work because it's just it's just code. It's not um, it's nothing magical. I alluded to this a bit more, but if you can try to figure out how you can build on previous things you built before. So I you know start. I did a a social network for my first job. I did another social network for my next job. Um, I worked on a CMS, and then and then two jobs later, I, I built a CMS. Um, I worked with reporters and journalists at the Sunlight Foundation, and then now I'm at Vox Media, which is also hires reporters and journalists. So building your, you know, build on top of, of, your, of your experiences. And, and when you're seeking for, when you're looking for jobs, think about how your previous experiences can help, how, help position you for future jobs. Um, here's a big one, which I like to tell people. So uh, who here knows what imposter syndrome is? Oh, most people do. Um, so uh, uh, just very quickly, imposter syndrome is when successful people feel that the success they have accomplished um, is not actually, should not be attributed to them. They feel that they are um, faking it, um, that they will be found out by their colleagues or by their boss, and that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they actually don't deserve it. So, it's a very real thing. A lot of people have it. Most successful people do have it. Um, I think if you if you don't have it um, and you're successful, you might be a sociopath. So just like, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so I actually had it just a few weeks ago. Um, I read this Medium article by a young woman who was a or is I don't know is a undergrad student at Columbia. She wrote this Medium essay about. Uh, writing, uh, you know, uh, making a full year of, of code commits on GitHub. Um, but she also talked about how, like, how it made her successful. Like she, she started by like, taking her first ever CS class in college, and then she got an internship at Percolate, which is like a marketing company in New York, and then she got an internship at Square, and then she got a job with Nihilus, the email client company, and then she got a job with Apple. And I was reading it, and I was like, oh my god, in like a year and a half, this young woman has like climbed the ladder so quickly, like what have I done with my career? Um, but I had to take a step back and realize, you know, that is not normal and um, some people um, will have more success than others and everyone uh, individually totally deserves their success. Um, here's one um, which is kind of a bit about bouncing around and, and building a career is, really do try to kind of bounce around a bit. Um, I say here every four years, maybe at least every four years, maybe more. Um, and the big thing to do from just a kind of a, stand, a personal financial 
security standpoint is to ask for a large salary bump when, when you change a job. Um, I have asked for 15% salary bumps for the last couple times I've changed jobs. Um, this most recent time, I, I got the full everything I was asking for. Previous times, I got maybe 10%, 12%. It's, it's changed. Um, but you know, 15% is not a terribly high, you know, it's not an outrageous number. It's definitely a high number. Um, and if anything, your, your, your prospective employer will kind of respect you for kind of asking for that bump. Um, and I'll, f I'll close by um, kind of my, uh, I call them code rules. So there's this guy, Michael Pollan, who, who did a thing called food rules, which is about like eating well, which is like eat food, not too much, mostly plants. It's his pity thing about eating good food. Um, mine is write code. Um, so essentially, remember that at the end, it's, it's about writing code. It's about understanding what makes good, uh, code good. Um, and just honing that, uh, building that craft. Um, nothing can, can replace it, like you know, doing um, talks or, or writing stuff or, or um, build, writing a book or something. Like at the end, you, you, you write code, and, like that's the job. Uh, next, keep it clean. So write good code um, as, as much as well as you can write it. Don't take shortcuts. Shortcuts will always kind of come back to bite you or your colleagues um, in the future. So keep it as clean as you can, and then share freely. Put stuff out there on open source. Um, share it with your colleagues at your, your office. Um, yeah, so write code, keep it clean, share freely. Um, and that's, that's my talk. Questions? Any questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, oh, I put a little um, plug for Code for Atlanta. So I, I organized a meetup called Code for Atlanta, which is a local chapter of Code for America. Um, I got involved with, really, in the days I was at Sunlight Foundation, I was open government, um, open, open source. Um, Code for America is a nonprofit in the Bay Area. They focus on a lot of the same things. Um, the first donation to actually start Code for America came from the Sunlight Foundation. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I just kind of know professionally people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, at the beginning you should just focus on one and get really good at it, as good as you think uh, you know is you, you'll be able to. Um, I'm surprised that you're learning both Rails and Mean at General Assembly, but um, I would say just pick the one that you think you first of all that you like better, that you just makes more sense to you, that you feel more comfortable with. Um, I am not, I don't know like job prospect wise which stack is you know you'll have to research that. Um, but I would, I would definitely suggest just sticking with one for like two, three years at, at least. Um, getting really good at it, knowing how to quickly do something, knowing how to quickly debug things in it, um, and then start branching out. I, I don't think you need to like start worrying about all these other technologies right away. I think uh, those two especially, they'll be good for many years from now. So they'll be in demand. Any other questions? Right. Um, so that those two fit, uh, are really kind of predicated on, you know, getting a job with a company that or organization that is established or is has set itself up for success. Um, by that I mean like a, a very well funded startup. Um, just getting that first job is 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 really what I mean by that. Where you are working for an organization or a company that they have real customers, um, they have a real user base, and uh, 
just seeing the feedback directly or just indirectly from a support team. Um, that will just help you understand what's, you know, what it means to write uh, solid code, uh, code or, or software that doesn't, is not prone to failure, that is, is, is going to be you know, resilient to all sorts of different uh, inputs that the world will, will throw at it. Um, yeah, so I would say just you know, look for that established company, even if it seems like somewhat boring, like that established company can really just help you figure out, okay, this is what it means to be a programmer in, in the world, and this is what, you know, it'll, it'll teach you all about like what it really means to kind of be that you know, day to day programmer for, for a company. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, can you speak up? Uh huh. Right. Sure. Yeah. So for those cloud services, yeah. Uh, so for those cloud services, um, the question was, uh, what cloud services, cloud frameworks does Rails um, kind of fit well with? Um, I would say the the primary one is Heroku. Um, Heroku is a platform that is built on top of Amazon, um, and they, are, they essentially give we as developers easy tools to get up and running with a Rails app. Um, that's the first one to look at. Um, generally, AWS is also very popular in the Rails world. Um, I, at Upworthy, we, we were both on Heroku and AWS. At Vox Media, we're on AWS. So, those are those are to me are the two. There's actually a lot of like learning one can do around AWS and all the different services it provides, especially around data and big data. Um, if you're a company and you're collecting a lot of data, AWS just has a lot of really great uh, services that you can harness that you don't have to build yourself or host yourself. Um, so I would look into that. I would say. Um, at, does the framework support it? Well, those those uh, cloud services support any frameworks, so it's it's um, you know it's they they run everything, so almost everything. Any other questions? All right, great, y'all. Thank you so much. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.